message and that God uses him. Lord God, you are an amazing God and we love you and we thank you for the opportunity we have to sit in your house, Lord God, and to be able to hear your word, to, to sing praise to you, God. And I just pray that this morning as we hear your word spoken by Dr. Powell, Lord, that you would just use him, that uh, he would be your mouthpiece, God, and that we would have open ears, open hearts to hear what you would have in our lives to change or to to remain steadfast in with our relationship with you, God. We love you, and we thank you for this opportunity we have to be with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. My name is Tim, by the way. That doctor stuff really gets old after a while. Huh? Forget that kind of stuff. Huh? All I am is a sinner saved by grace, just like most of the rest of us. Huh? But, you know, I follow up on what Pastor Chris said. I, I always believe it's cool to be in God's house. <laughs> so we know that for certain today, don't we? Yeah, praise the Lord. Huh? That's a great stuff. Hey, I bring you greetings from our college. I uh, want to say thank you. It's a privilege for, uh, for me to be to serve at the college. I served in a couple of different stints there. Uh, well, the first time back in the seven, back in the 90s, rather, I served at the college. And it was during that time I had the privilege to have some folks in class that you know, like uh, some guy named Steve Taylor. And the guy that was up here and uh, had the thing on his foot, uh, he was uh, Scott. He was in some of the classes and, and uh, some of the others. In fact, uh, Steve Taylor and uh, our son were close friends. They, they were roommates together, in fact, later on in college. And Steve was in our son's wedding, and so we've known Steve and his family for a long time. Uh, in fact, that young lady who was making those announcements up here, I was able to have her in a class at a different, uh, different campus. And so we've known some of the folks uh, for a while here. And then we're back again on the second stint. We've been back again now for the, about the last five or six years and been serving in various capacities. And just as of the summer, July have assume the office of the presidency, and it's uh, quite a privilege to do that. Uh, I want to thank you for all your support of the college, uh, your prayer support. I trust you're already praying for the college. If you are, keep doing it and pray more. If you aren't yet praying, we encourage you to become one of our intercessors. Uh, join the president's intercessory circle and become one of our prayer, prayer warriors for the college. We need all the prayers we can get. Some of you are givers. You support us, support us financially. We appreciate that very much. We encourage you to keep doing that. If you're not, we're always open to that. If you uh, need to take some classes, we'd welcome you as a student. Or if you know others who need to take classes, we'd welcome them as well. So we'll send them our way. But main thing is, thank you for letting us encroach on your space here at uh, Harmony Church. We sort of invaded your turf, and we're thankful you're allowing us to do that. God bless you for that. My wife and I, uh, we probably don't look too familiar to many of you. We usually come to the 8 o'clock service. And my wife over there, Charlene, uh, we usually come to the 8 o'clock service, and so we're familiar with a number of those folks, and then we typically go out to other churches and try to represent the college in other locations on Sunday morning. So that's why you haven't seen us a whole lot in this service, even though we've sneaked in a few times. And I uh, usually try to be here on Sunday evening, and I don't see some of you there. So just uh, <laughs> maybe tonight. Huh? Yeah, so anyway, it's just a privilege to be here with you. And God bless you for all you are and all you do. We are praying for Pastor Chad and Pastor Mike and Pastor Brian while they're away. You know, been, been there, done some of that that they're doing myself in various parts of the world. And it's a great blessing, but it can also be pretty grueling. And so we trust you'll keep praying for them. The exciting thing is that when you serve in some place like Thailand, usually you get home before you leave. <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's one of the most exciting things about it. So, but we're going to pray for them and ask God to help them on their return trip. Will you bow your head with me? Let's pray, and we're asking not only God's blessing on today's message, but also on our pastors who are away from us. Let's pray together. Father God, we are so thankful for the incredible blessings you bestow upon us, blessings we do not deserve, but are more abundant than we can even begin to number. Thank you for your grace and mercy to us. And Lord, we do pray today that you would especially be with the pastors who are away. We thank you, Lord, for those who will be receiving instruction from them. We're confident, Lord, that because of Harmony Church sending their staff there, that those pastors who come to receive their teaching will have a profound impact, a much more profound and powerful impact on their parts of the world than they would ever have without what they will receive from our pastors here. So we pray your blessing upon that entire endeavor. Keep our pastors safe as they travel back and forth and while they're there in the nation. We pray your blessing upon them. Pray for their families who are still here, who are, leave, leave, who are left behind while they're away. Ask your Holy Spirit to just guide, over, watch over them and guide them and bless them in special ways. And we pray especially for those pastors who were there, that, Lord, the instruction they, they receive will lead to a great revival 
in their parts of the world. Bless them and be with them. We also pray today, Father, for needs here amongst us. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to those folks who might have physical needs, have financial needs, uh, relationship needs, whatever they are. We just ask, Lord, that you'd especially bless and be with them. And today we pray in particular for uh, the situation in St. Croix. We pray, Lord, for the pastor there of that, of that church and that school who's even now on his way back to the state for some medical treatments, for heart problems. We just ask God you'd be with him, with his family. We pray for the medical personnel, the doctors, technicians who will, who will minister to him through their, through their skills and their gifts. Bless them, we pray, and heal him completely in the name of Jesus. And be with, uh, be with Mike back there in St. Croix as he takes care of situations there. Bless him in a special way. Thank you for your goodness and grace. And now, Lord, as we look to your word for a few minutes today, we just pray that you'd guide and bless. Use us, we ask. May your Holy Spirit superintend. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, some of you probably don't know this, but every year there is a World Puzzle Championship. May not rank right up there with the Super Bowl or what the World Series, but every year there is a World Puzzle Championship. And it takes place at various locations around the globe. In fact, a couple of years ago, they held it over in Croatia. And there were about 150 people from around the world from like 26, 27 different nations who converged on that location in Croatia to take part in the World Puzzle Championship. And according to Time Magazine, these, these connoisseurs of puzzles, they are, these are people who eat, drink, and dream puzzles all the time. Uh, maybe they're like some of you who right now may be doing puzzles on your phone. <laughs> if it's not football, it might be a puzzle. Huh? We trust you're not doing that, though. But the article went on to explain, of course, that these folks who gather for the World Puzzle Championships aren't the only people who are into puzzles. There are literally millions of people around the world who do crossword puzzles. Some of you do that? Uh, there are other kinds of puzzles people do. Well, what is that one that's called? What is it Sudoku or Sudoku or something like that? People work on those things. Uh, I can't even pronounce the name, let alone work on the puzzle. Uh, and then, of course, there are always those people who do puzzles on their computers. Some say when they're supposed to be working, eh? they're playing solitaire or doing things like that. So puzzle workers are all over the place. But why are puzzles so popular? Well, one fellow who happens to be the, the, the crossword editor for the New York Times and National Public Radio, he provides this explanation, his own words. He says, we're faced with problems every day in life, and we almost never get clarity. We jump into the middle of a problem. We carry it through to whatever extent we can find an answer, and then we move on to the next thing. We jump into something else. But with a human-made puzzle, he says, we have the satisfaction of being completely in control. You start the challenge from the beginning, you move all the way to the end. That, there's a satisfaction in that, he says, you can't get in real life. You feel in control, and that's a great feeling. Well, on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, I want to go to the very end of the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. We're going to read from the very end in just a moment. But Romans chapter 8 really is what I would describe as one of the most uh, breathtaking chapters in all the Bible. If you don't think you have any reasons to be thankful as we move into this Thanksgiving week, I encourage you, I challenge you later on to take out your Bible and read through the entire try eighth chapter of the book of Romans. And as you do so, just meditate on what it says. It documents some of the most amazing blessings that we enjoy as followers of Jesus Christ. Blessings that should prompt what, what I would describe as gratitude of great magnitude. When you realize what that chapter says to us, the gratitude should just sort of begin rumbling from way down deep and just start gushing forth eventually. Because that chapter celebrates, among other things, the, the spirit, the spirit we have as believers. You know that person we call the Holy Spirit? That, that one who, who ministers to us so magnificently, teaches, comforts, challenges, directs, counsels, does all that wonderful stuff for us. That chapter also extols the supernatural status that we enjoy as God's people and as part of his uh, forever family. We've been adopted into his family. We're heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ, it says. That's phenomenal. 
when you really understand what that means. That chapter goes on to, to describe the support that we have as, as members of God's family. Isn't it great to be able to come together with God's family and, and find, find encouragement, find direction, find wisdom, find support, find counsel? Especially in those times of confusion or weakness, we can find the grace we need to sort of soothe our hurts, and silence our groanings. But then as we come to the concluding verses of this phenomenal chapter, what we find are statements that, that celebrate the certainty, the certainty, the security we have when we put our trust in God and keep it there day after day after day because God is the one who can take this muddled up puzzle we call life put all the pieces in place and keep them there forever if we will but trust him and allow him to do so. See, no matter what happens along life's journey, we, when we put our trust in him, we can be certain till the final curtain. We can be certain until the curtain closes on our earthly journey and God takes us on to glory. That's what I want to talk to you about today. Certain till the final curtain. That should be one of those things in our lives for which we express gratitude of great magnitude. And so the last verses of the chap eighth chapter of the book of Romans is where we go. These are verses likely familiar to many of you, especially the first one we're going to read. If you don't know Romans 8.28 by memory, I encourage you to memorize this one as quickly as possible. Great, great, wonderful statement. Here's what it says, the NIV. It says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Uh, that... Those elements in that little statement have often been called the golden chain of redemption. It takes us all the way from the beginning of our salvation to the ultimate glory in heaven with the Lord. Next verse says, what, what then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom... God has chosen. It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are great verses, aren't they? Well, what great promises, what great assurances, what great power just sort of rumbles up out of those verses. Now, puzzle experts may love the feeling of being in control when they put that final puzzle piece in place. But the Bible, in my own personal experience, tells me that no matter how hard I try, I will never be able to get my life together. If you're chronologically gifted like I am, you've probably come to that realization. As we get older, we realize we can't ever get all the pieces together. Some of you younger people might think you're gonna, you've already got it together or you're going to get it together. Well, you may change your mind as you add a few more decades like some of us have. huh? Yeah. No matter how hard I try, I'll never be able to get all those pieces in place, and if I do think I've got them there, pretty soon one's going to fall out. It's going to break off or dump off the table, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I just don't have that kind of control. But when I turn my life over to the almighty puzzle solver, when I turn my life over to the almighty, 
When I give him all the pieces, when I turn control over to him, I don't need to worry. I don't need to wonder about what's ahead. You see, I can be certain all the way to that final curtain until this life journey is even complete. That's because, you see, I can rest in the assurance of no reservations. And that's great reason to be thankful. I can rest in the assurance of no reservations. So when you think of what you might have to be grateful for, I want you to just say no. And the first no I want you to think about is no reservations. No reservations. So there was this couple named Bob and Pamela Armstrong. And a few years back on Valentine's Day, Bob bought his wife Pamela a beautiful Valentine bouquet. And brought it home, gave it to her, and of course Pamela was just elated. She loved it. Any, any of you ladies in here like to receive flowers? Guys, are you watching and listening? Huh? Huh? Hint, hint. Okay. Well, there was a problem. A few days later, after the Valentine bouquet showed up, Bob and Pamela's little pet kitten, named Elvis, began to be acting very lethargic, was sort of sickly. You know, what was, didn't even want to eat. You know, not even the, the evening treats that Pamela regularly gave him. I suspect maybe a little catnip. He didn't even want to eat that. So she knew something was, 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 was definitely wrong. And so the next day or so, Bob and Pamela took their little pet kitten Elvis to the vet to see if they could figure out what might, might be the issue. And so the vet did some blood tests. And sure enough, the blood tests revealed that, that one of the plants in that Valentine bouquet had, had created a poison in, in, the, in the little cat's blood system, his bloodstream. And because of that, his kidneys were beginning to fail. So the Armstrongs weren't quite sure what to do, but they loved their little rescued pet, their little kitten named Elvis. And they would spare no expense to make sure that that little kitten was taken care of. And so they took Elvis to the renal transplant program at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. Hmm. And for the next month, the Armstrongs drove Elvis, you know, back and forth, two hours each way, three times a week for dialysis treatment. I don't think my wife would even do that for me. If I was just, you know. And then a team of veterinarians performed a kidney transplant on this former abandoned feral cat. And the Armstrong said, we practically lived at the ICU. You know, they spent over $15,000 for the surgery. And that didn't even include their travel costs, driving back and forth all those times, and you know, lodging, and meals, restaurants, all that kind of stuff. So probably somewhere approaching $20,000 they spent on this cat. And the cat came through it. Cat survived. Elvis is alive. <laughs> yeah, just in case you had any doubt. Okay? Huh? Yeah. But of course, you also know how cats react when you do something for them. Unfortunately, that's sometimes how I react when somebody does something for me or when God does something for me. But, you know, to make a long story short, you know, we, we have several cats at our house. One we chose. Several chose us, and we have several that have been thrust upon us by our family members who decided they could no longer keep the cats. And I, I'm sorry, I, maybe I should admit this, but I don't think for all those cats I would be willing to spend $15, well maybe, but not $15,000 to cause them to survive. And that's just, that's just over the top as far as I'm concerned. I mean, we love our pets. Yeah, we love, I mean, some friends of ours spent over $8,000 on a dog that got attacked. So we love our pets, I know that, okay? But I can't imagine spending that kind of money, going to that expense to keep an abandoned stray cat alive. But, you know, then I, I think about the extremes to which God is willing to go to save me. 
the expense he incurs, the pain he endures to save a sick, abandoned, pretty much worthless sinner like me. And I stand in awe of God's goodness. You see, God holds nothing back. He spares no expense. There's no cost too high, no effort too great, no pain too unbearable. As far as God is concerned, there are no reservations when it comes to what he's willing to do to turn the loser that I used to be into the winner I am today only because of him and all that he has done. It's not about me. It's about what he's done to take a loser like me and make me one of his beloved. I stand amazed. You know, that sort of gets, gets my joy juices sort of flowing when I think about what God's done. I don't know about yours. It looks like they're still pretty latent. Nothing, nothing's running yet, it doesn't look like, okay? Uh, but, but that sort of gets uh, my gratitude stirred up. I'm so thankful what God has done. Remember, he reached out to us when we wanted nothing to do with him. Hmm? He rescued us when we were on the fast track to death and destruction. He recreated us, transformed us from sinners to saints, called us, chose us, forgave us, glorified us, took us from, from being gross, ultimately being glorified. He miraculously refines us so we end up looking like Jesus. Look at the person next to you. You know, see, if, does that person look like Jesus a little bit? You're not looking, you're looking at me. And I know I don't look like Jesus. Look at the person next to you and see if that person looks a little bit like Jesus. Huh? And then I want you to look at them again next Sunday because they should look a little more like Jesus next Sunday. That's what God does. When we put our faith in Christ and we accept the salvation God offers, that's what God does. And he holds, there's no reservations when it comes to him performing that task. He continually rearranges the messes we make in our lives into something for our good and for his glory. In all things, he works for the good of those who love him. I mean, you've done it as well as I have. I've made a tremendous mess out of some situation. And lo and behold, before I know it, God comes along and miraculously uses that for his glory and for my good. He puts that piece in that puzzle in an absolutely supernatural way that I could never have done, that I can't figure out. That's what God does. And you know, perhaps most amazingly of all, he replaces us. You see, we, we should have been the ones who were on the cross. We should have died for our sins, but he replaces us on the cross with his very own beloved son. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? He gave his all so we could have it all, didn't he? No reservation. See, with my faith fixed in Jesus, I can be certain all along the journey, all the way to the final curtain, when my journey finally concludes. I don't need to worry. I don't need to wonder. I don't need to fuss. I don't need to fume. I can rest in that assurance. And be thankful because God holds nothing back. He spares no expense to turn a born loser like me into a reborn, beloved member of his family. That's pretty awesome. That's astounding. That's miraculous. So, master is willing to invest $15,000 for a kidney transplant for a cat. I would think Elvis would be pretty happy, would be pretty grateful. But how much more, how much more grateful should I be for the investment God has made to give me not just a kidney transplant, he gave me a life transplant. He gave me a life transplant, made me a brand new creation through Jesus Christ. You see, when it comes to my well-being, when it comes to your well-being, God says, no reservations. And when I say that, some of you are thinking, hmm, 
I wonder where we're going to lunch after service. Have we made reservations? Not that kind of reservations. God says no reservations. I'm going to hold nothing back because I want to bless so richly. I don't know about you, but that, that makes me be thankful when I contemplate what God has done. Hmm? But there's, there's more. No reservations isn't the end of the story. I can also be certain till the final curtain because God also says no condemnation. God says no condemnation. And what an amazing reason to be grateful. No condemnation. You know, one day a, a businessman heard about a, a lady in the, in the community where he worked, an elderly lady, a widow lady, and who was unable to pay her rent. And so compassion sort of welled up within, and he was feeling some pity for her, wanted to help. And so he, he talked to some of his coworkers and asked if they'd be willing to help. And so many of them responded. And so they all sort of chipped in, and they gathered up enough money to cover a couple of months' rent for this widow lady. And so he gathered up the money, and he, he went to the lady's house a few days later. And he got there. You know, he was pretty sure she was home. And he knocked on the door, waited a few, few minutes. Nobody came. You know, knocked again. Nobody came. Again, he was pretty certain she was there, but nobody was coming to the door. He did it a third time, a fourth time, and... Finally, after he was, had been standing out in front of the door about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, you know, pausing in between the times that he knocked, um, nobody came to the door. So he finally, he finally turned around and left. Well, a couple of days later, he was downtown, and he happened to run into this lady. She was down there. He ran into her. He walked up to her and said, Ma'am, you know, I want you to know that some friends of mine, my, uh, me and some friends, we, we heard about your situation, and we, we want to help. And so we, 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 got, we got enough money together to, to cover a couple of months' rent for you. And I came to your house just a few days ago to give it to you. Knocked on the door several times, but, but nobody ever came. And the lady was a little distraught. Her eyes got real big, and she looked back. She sort of threw her hands up on her face, and she said, Oh, no, I, I, I knew you were there, and I thought you were the landlord coming to evict me. You know, it's... It, Sadly, far too many Christians sort of see God the same way. Some kind of an angry landlord that all he wants to do is evict us. Wants to kick us out of his kingdom. Folks who labor under a load of guilt and of shame, worry, thinking they haven't been good enough or they haven't done enough or they haven't given enough to appease the Lord to make themselves acceptable in his sight. But the reality is just the opposite, isn't it? God always comes to bless. Now, sometimes his blessing might involve some correction, but he always comes to bless, doesn't he? He always comes to help. He always comes to give. And we can never be good enough. We can never do enough. We can never give enough to garner God's favor or to earn our salvation. God's already done everything for us. All he wants to do is give it. What we do is receive. That's what grace is about. God is not against us. God is for us, isn't he? Our passage says that specifically. If God is for us, who can be against us? And he is for us. Turn those words around. What the apostle is really saying is, since God is for us, nobody can be against us. Since God is for us, no one can ever overcome us. God is for me. God is for you. And I'm not sure that there's a greater statement anywhere in the Bible than that one. Hmm? I mean, how, how can I help but burst forth with gratitude when I realize that God is for me? How do we know he's for us? Because he didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. And when we put our trust in the one who gave his son, we put our faith in the, in the son who gave his all for us, no charges brought against us will ever stick. I mean, it's true. I mean, the devil, the devil may accuse. You know, we have an enemy out there who goes around as a roaring lion. 
He's seeking someone to devour, and he's after you, and he's after me. But God is for us. God is on our side. God is fighting our battle. The devil may accuse us. He may try to bring us down. He may try to heap on us a load of guilt. But he can never be victorious so long as we let the Lord fight our battles. Anybody listening? Why? Because God has already issued the verdict. And that verdict is not guilty. That verdict is justified. That verdict is forgiven. You see, once we fix our faith in Jesus, we are uncondemned, aren't we? Because Jesus paid the price for our guilt. He died in our place. He took our condemnation. And now, risen, ascended back to heaven, what does our passage say? It says Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father, and he is interceding for us. He's pleading our case. Yeah, the devil may bring accusation, but Jesus says to the Father, not so fast. Remember, Father, that person has put his faith in me, and my blood has forgiven his sin. He stands now in my kingdom as a member of our family. Condemnation is gone. The guilt is lifted. He's there. Jesus is at the Father's right hand, pleading our case, interceding for us. You see, we could have, we could have the best best attorney we could imagine. We could have you know a combination of Perry Mason and 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 Ben Matlock and Johnny Cochran and throw in Gloria Allred, pleading our case, and that wouldn't begin to compare with the one we have in the Father's presence, pleading our case for us. As, as long as my trust stays fixed on Jesus, as long as I serve him as faithfully as I can with the help of the Holy Spirit, I can rest in the assurance of no condemnation all the way to the end. Now, we may slip up once in a while. We may falter. But that's when we know if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and cleanse us again from all unrighteousness, won't he? He doesn't take us out of, the, out of the family. It just means we've got to apologize to God because we blew it. And he'll forgive us. Hmm? No condemnation. The great proclamation that begins this chapter, Romans chapter 8, says this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For those who put their faith in him as their savior and as their Lord. So I have a question for you. Are you feeling grateful yet? Huh? Don't be afraid to sort of say so. You know? Let God know that you're thankful for who he is and what he's done. But it's not, he doesn't finish there. I can also be certain to the final curtain because God also says no separation. No separation. Even till the very end of my earthly journey. I can rest in the assurance that no thing and no one will ever be able to separate me from, the, from my Lord and from the blessings he laid up for those who love him. And I am so thankful for that. Just uh, on this morning's weather news, you may have been hearing some of this. There were reports again of some pretty severe weather back toward the Midwest and the East Coast. Even some more tornadoes hitting in places like Indiana back in the Midwest just this morning. In fact, one of the one of the videos on television showed the steeple of a church sort of bent over, bent down, because it got hit by F3 wind from a tornado that swept through a community in, 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 Indiana, in, in Indiana. Those things seem to happen on sort of a regular basis in that part of the country. But I remember a report from oh, two, three years ago now about the series of the tornadoes that swept through the midsection of our nation. And one, one report was just especially poignant, so, so heart-wrenching. Uh, a young mother was outside when this, the winds of this tornado swept through and she was holding her, her infant baby, her infant son in her, in her arms. And the, the winds were so severe that, that they actually tore that baby out of her arms and carried him off. They found his remains a couple days later about 200 yards away. 
from where his mother had tried to hold on to him but simply could not. And that storm ripped that baby out of her arms. I can't imagine anything more devastating, more heart-wrenching than that, to have that baby you love literally ripped away from you. Horrible. But now the flip side of that, what our passage here in Romans tells us, that no matter how intense the storms of life may become, no matter how serious the struggles or how painful the journey, the assurance we have from God's word is that nothing, that no one and no thing has the power to pry us out of God's loving arms as long as we allow his powerful loving arms to hold us. Nothing, no one can pry us out of there. Trouble can't, hardship can't, no matter how much pressure or affliction or oppression or anguish or heartbreak we face, neither can the persecution, the rejection, the disgrace, the humiliation that may be heaped on us by a demented and demonic world. Not even the greatest danger, the very threat of death itself by the sword can yank us out of the almighty loving arms of God. What shall separate us? What does our scripture say? Absolutely nothing can do that. Absolutely nothing. And I don't know about you, but for me, that's reason to be grateful. That God's going to hold me in his loving arms no matter what. And nothing and no one, not even you, can rip me out of there. So the year was A.D. 155. Persecution against Christians was sweeping across the Roman Empire. And it finally came to the city of Smyrna. That's in modern-day Turkey. We actually hear of the city of Smyrna in the book of Revelation. One of the letters of the churches is written to the church at Smyrna. The, the proconsul of Smyrna, that's like the Roman governor of the area. The proconsul of Smyrna issued an edict that the bishop of Smyrna, a man by the name of Polycarp, was to be found, he was to be arrested, he was to be hauled into the arena for execution because to claim Jesus as Lord would not be tolerated when only Caesar was to be recognized as Lord. And so the authorities went out. They found Polycarp. Polycarp, by the way, was actually a disciple of John the Beloved, one of the disciples of Jesus, the guy who wrote the book of John, who wrote the book of Revelation. Polycarp was one of his disciples, knew him personally. Polycarp is rounded up. He's hauled into the arena. Thousands of people in the arena screaming for his blood. But the Roman proconsul had compassion on this elderly man. Uh, reports say that, that Polycarp by this time was in his 90s, maybe upward of 100 years old. The crowd was screaming for his blood. The proconsul silenced the crowd. And to Polycarp, the proconsul issued this statement. He said... Curse the Christ and live. Curse Jesus Christ and you will live. And the crowd silenced and waited for the old man to respond. In an amazingly strong voice, Polycarp said this, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has never done me wrong. How dare I now blaspheme the name of my king and of my Lord? And with that declaration still echoing around the arena, Polycarp was put to death. But even in death, there is no separation. For I am convinced, our passage says, that neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, not even death itself has the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can you say hallelujah with me? That's pretty special. Hmm? That is pretty special. I'm so thankful. And of course, we all know so, no doubt, that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Nothing's going to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. No separation. All because the goodness of God to us, his grace and his goodness. And just one more thing. I can also rest in the assurance of no desperation 
all the way to that final curtain. I can be certain. No desperation. A fellow went kayaking off the coast of England over in sort of those frigid waters of the North Atlantic up there. He was out there kayaking. And he, he was a pretty experienced kayaker, but on this particular occasion, he ran into a little bit of rough surf, and he capsized. He capsized in treacherous water. He kayak overturned. He was thrown out. He struggled back up through the water. He, he clung onto the side of his kayak, but in the meantime, he was able to pull out his cell phone, and he could push one button. He pushed one button, and it dialed his father. Now, it didn't matter to this son who was out there in those treacherous waters on the verge of drowning, didn't matter to him that his father, who stood in the British military, was almost 4,000 miles away training troops over in Dubai. He pressed that button, cell phone connected to his father. His father picked up. His father received his son's call 3,500 miles away. His father immediately hung up from his son. He dialed, he, he, re he relayed his son's mayday to the Coast Guard installation that was nearest his son's location off the coast of England. Amazingly, it was like one mile away. In less than 10 minutes, his son was plucked out of the water by the British Coast Guard. The struggling kayaker was lifted out of those frigid waters. Maybe you've discovered. I think I have, and I'm still learning. But even when life capsizes, even when I feel like I'm drowning in turbulent waters, even when all the pieces of my life seem to be falling apart, I can rely on my Father to come to my rescue. Hmm? I send him a mayday, and God will be on scene before I know it. I mean, after all, he is the one, isn't he, who works all things for the good of those who love him. He is looking out for you. He is looking out for me. He's the master puzzle solver. Hmm? He's the one who takes the tattered and discolored and misshapen pieces of my life and puts them together to create a masterpiece that will bring him glory. And in the process, it will also be for my greatest good. That's the way he works. That's what he does. And that masterpiece he's creating out of my life always seems to be looking more and more like Jesus, his son. See, when we enter in relationship with him, we can when we turn control of our lives over to our Lord, he sets us on a path to be conformed to the likeness of his son. And as long as I trust his control, let him have his way. I, I don't need to fuss or, or fume or, or worry or, or, or wonder. God's going to do his great work in my life. He's going to do his gracious work in my life all the way to the end. I mean, the world wants to squeeze me into its mold. The world wants to squeeze you into its mold. But God is constantly squeezing us into his. And in the process, makes us look more like his son. And that process will never stop. It will never be complete until we enter the presence of Jesus himself. Those he foreknows, those with whom he enters into relationship, he predestines. He has a purpose. And that purpose is to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus. And those he calls, he justifies. And those he justifies, those he saves, he ultimately glorifies, doesn't he? I, I hope you heard what that says. Okay? It says, he's doing the work. He's doing all the work. I can't make myself like Jesus. I can't justify myself. I can't glorify myself. Only God can accomplish those things. And the good news is, he will do it. If I just trust him, if I just let him have control of my life, he will do it. Of that, I can be certain. All the way to that final curtain, when the curtain closes on my earthly journey. He does all the work. All I do is cooperate. He does all the work. I get all the blessings. He takes all those pieces. He doesn't just make us victorious or conquerors. 
says we are more than conquerors. Isn't we love that? You know what that word? That word actually says we are super conquerors through him who loves us. We are super conquerors through him who loves us. You see, those who put their faith in Jesus, they're the real superheroes of our world. We just need to get out there and act like it. We're the super conquerors because we have experienced the power of God, power of God over sin, death, hell, and the grave. We are super conquerors through him who loved us. Longtime church leader by the name of Vance Havner, you may have heard of him. He once made this, this very sage observation. He said, the entire Christian life is one big thank you. The entire Christian life is one big thank you. The living expression of our gratitude for, to God for his goodness. But we so often take him for granted. And what we take for granted, we never take seriously. We so often take him for granted. And what we take for granted, we never take seriously. Will you bow your heads with me? How seriously, my friend, are you really taking the Lord and what he's done for you?